So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here and for those on the live stream as well and for those that are watching uh, when we send this out digitally. It's my pleasure to share with you tonight's State of the Opera. Before I begin, I'd like to offer my deepest gratitude to the Crown Plaza for their partnership. Ken Knight and his team have been such remarkable partners for Knoxville Opera over the years, uh, providing rooms for us, for artists, space when we need it, and uh, they've been incredibly generous to us. I also wanted to express my gratitude to the Board of Directors for giving me this incredible opportunity to lead this great organization. It's hard to believe that I'm actually completing my second year as the Executive Director because I, I still feel very much like the new guy. Um, after a year of working remotely, my family and I moved here in July, eventually found a house to live in. And uh, yeah, it's been nice to finally have some in-person meetings. Knoxville Opera is a great company and you all have so much to be proud of. And under the leadership of the board of directors and Maestro Seleski, Knoxville Opera has transitioned itself from a company that was in financial crisis uh, to one with, with remarkable stability, um, all while presenting quality opera year after year. And of course, that would not be possible without the support of all of you. So thank you for that. And now here we stand, uh, continuing to weather the most significant crisis of a generation. And what an enviable time to, to join an opera company and try to figure that model out. Um, but you know, we share this enthusiasm for the future. And I feel that every time I meet somebody about what's possible with this company in this city, and there are so many exciting things to share. So I thought, well, let's just get started. We've certainly faced our, our fair share of challenges over the past year beyond the obvious headliners, the economy, inflation, the price of gases, the logistics of gathering crowds in the midst of a global pandemic. Not easy. Of course, the impact that all of that has on the economy uh, and on philanthropy. So not long after I arrived in Knoxville, I received a notice that our warehouse space, which contained a ton of set materials, large props, et cetera, as you see here, the building was gonna be sold. For years, KO has been blessed to have 10,000 square feet of warehouse space donated to us. And you know, the real estate market has been red hot and warehouse space is not an exception. After a desperate search of our own, you know, the only viable option for us was seven of these large 40 yard dumpsters. And so here's a picture of our warehouse before that's the day we started putting, you know, deciding what's going to keep and what we have to get rid of. The dumpsters are where you see the light. That's where they go to meet their maker. And that's what it looked like afterwards before. And you can just see all the stuff that's there, platforms and all that. We saved a lot of platforms, but so much stuff gone. It was a big, expensive, depressing job. So we were fortunate enough to find a warehouse space that was smaller. So it wasn't a total loss. But of course, we rent that space now. So not only did we lose the stuff, but now we have had to add another item to our budget every year. This is our office building. I don't know if we have a 7500 square foot office space just in the old city, just two blocks north of where the stadium is going to be built. So for many years, we've been benefited from very, very low rent for this space. Unfortunately, we're currently negotiating uh, a, a lease agreement that will represent a very, very significant increase in our rent. In light of the current market, I am glad and grateful that we have a place to go, uh, that we have a place to work, a place to rehearse operas um, while we figure out our long-term facility plan. We need to figure out a long-term facility plan for our office, for our rehearsal space, and for warehouse space. But that presentation's for another day. Uh, so this evening we have much to celebrate uh, and much to share, so we'll get on with that. But I'm just planting that seed that that is a conversation we'll be having in the months and years to come. As you know, our response to the pandemic was the launch of Knox Opera for All. Um, this focuses entirely on free and accessible performances in every corner of our city and even in our region. And um, in two years, thanks to Maestro Seleski, we've presented in two years over 200 of these performances and will continue to do so for many years to come. Now, of course, we were all overjoyed. 
when we made our return to the Tennessee theater with the production of Mephistopheles, exactly 747 days since our last production. That's easy number to remember because you think big as a big number, but it's also a big plane. So the 747 is easy to remember. Um, producing opera is a tremendous undertaking. I mean, you get, before you start, you're from the point of hiring the artists and the chorus and dancers, the orchestra, the production team, the stage crew, coordinating the logistics of transportation, getting them here, where are they going to stay, the housing, um, determining our needs for creating a set. Do we rent a set? Do we paint a set? Do we build a set? Do we... How do we source our props, our costumes, our wigs and lighting? You know, all of these things, box office marketing, it just goes on and on. All this work happens before we even set foot into the first staging rehearsal with all the artists. So then throw COVID into the mix. And when you're producing Mephistopheles, which has 200 artists and artisans and craftsmen and crew choreographed in close proximity to each other. To give you a taste of the stakes that are involved with that, if one of our principal artists had had an ill-timed positive COVID test, we would have had to close the whole production down because we can't afford to have backup singers to all the lead roles and all that. So that is the stakes that were at hand, which is why we had the protocols in place during rehearsals and in the audience. So it was terrifying. Um, that said, producing opera under normal circumstances is a big job. So throw in the, throw in the COVID logistics and safety protocols and all that makes it a tremendously challenging undertaking. It took an army to pull it off, but leading the effort was the work of five, only five full-time employees at Knoxville Opera. So I'd be grateful if you join me in acknowledging uh, Brian, Don, Marie, and Esther for their heroic work. Thank you. Thank you. The heroics of this small yet mighty team, in addition to a host of volunteers, they also brought us the return of the Rossini Festival in April. And for a change, apparently, because it was my first, but the weather did not disappoint, and it was packed. There are several of you that volunteered that day. God bless you. Thank you. Estimates of attendees that day, if you were there, you would, you would acknowledge it. We had anywhere between 60 and 90,000 people come on a Saturday that day. Now, I don't think I mentioned, but because you know sleep is far clearly overrated, we also produced that Puccini Gala concert the night before that. So yeah, we're a little bit insane. Nobody slept, especially Don. God bless you, Don. I don't know how you do it. We got to stop doing that. Um, <laughs> so but anyway, it, it's we've had a lot going on this year artistically, of which we're very proud. Three years ago, it was well before the pandemic started, uh, the board made an unusual, yet what became a prophetic move when they laid down the groundwork with Maestro Seleski for what effectively became a two-year leadership transition plan. My interview for this job actually took place the weekend of Romeo and Juliet, just weeks before COVID shut everything down. So since the day I was hired, Maestro Seleski and I, we've navigated an unprecedented crisis. And I'm so grateful for the two years I've had to learn the ropes and plan for the company's future, all while I didn't have to worry, while, I, while we regained our artistic footing in this difficult time. So I'm so grateful to Maestro for making sure that KO's presence in our community re remained strong throughout the pandemic. I'm also grateful for these wonderful people who have agreed to join the KO team this summer. So last December, uh, KO sent out a press release uh, announcing the new artistic team that that'll begin in July. And here you see uh, one of the local outlets that picked it up, Arts Knoxville. Now I wanted to bring attention to this one in particular because at the end of December, Arts Knoxville announced that our news release found a huge national interest and was their most read story of 2021 by a sizable margin. We, we, our readership for that, art, for that uh, story was 10 times larger than the second place article, if that tells you the interest uh, that surrounds uh, what's going on at this company. So I'm pleased to introduce you to our new team members this evening. Dean Anthony is joining us online, and uh, in attendance here, we welcome Kate, Katura, and Elizabeth to the Opera family. So let's give them a welcome. <laughs> I 
Thank you. This is, it's an incredibly talented group of people who are well respected in our industry, and they're going to play a very important part in the execution of our mission moving forward. And speaking of which, our mission. So a mission statement, 18 months ago, the board engaged in facilitated discussions, and we've had conversations around the revision of Knoxville Opera's mission statement. Uh, a mission statement simply answers what we do and why we exist. So we started from our previous mission statement, as you see here. And now if you look at this word cloud, these are the primary keywords that were mentioned the most during our discussions. The most commonly words stand out more. Obviously, connection and story, power, storytelling, Knoxville, Knox, belonging, experience. Um, you know, these words gave birth to our new mission statement, which I'm pleased to announce publicly for the first time our mission to create vocal and theatrical experiences, what we do, that entertain, provoke, and console, why we exist. During the past few months, we've also been engaged in a rebranding process, which centered around these themes and ideas. So we acknowledge in our mission statement, in fact, that opera as a form of entertainment can provide relief from the issues of the day. But the real power of opera is giving voice to stories that promote understanding, empathy, and connection. So for the logo, we played around with the shortened version of Knox, the phonetic reading of KNX, which sounds like connects. Um, we're also drawn to circles and circuits and how they also imply a certain degree of connectedness. Um, and although we'll certainly continue to, to broaden our impact th throughout the region, we wanted to make sure that Knoxville sits at the center of who we are and what we do. So fusing these themes and ideas, I'm pleased to unveil the new company logo. Knoxville Opera, giving voice to stories that connect us. So next up, you'll see our logo on the left. Next up, um, we'll also begin discussion around logos, potential logos for all the other activities and groups uh, that sit under the KO umbrella. These are just some sample uh, designs as we begin that process. Nothing final here. In fact, I, I share these only so we can begin having your input and ideas about what these might look like. Um, so, so that's in, in process. So we'd love to see it. We'll have these on the easel on the side after the, present, after the presentation's done. You're welcome to come look. We'd love to hear from you. Also in development, we have a new company website and an app that will be the source of a lot of new digital content that we'll be producing. Our path to the audience of tomorrow is to, to engage with them where they are. And all of us know, if you're at a certain age, this is where we, we find them on their devices. So this technology will help us do that, to help us find another way to build those audiences for tomorrow that care about this art form and how the storytelling the magic that happens in opera uh, can engage and be relevant to them. So with all of this in place, let's talk about next season. Woohoo! So three unique productions in three unique venues, and I'm excited to finally share some of those details with you. I believe that it's important to feature new works uh, within our offerings each season because there's so many great stories that need to be told on our stages. And as we venture into this work, I've been particularly drawn to military themed productions. So many of you heard me talk about some of these operas that I'd love to bring to Knoxville. And well, this desire is destined to become a reality right out of the gate because our very first production of the season this fall will be presented in tandem with the Medal of Honor celebration that's coming back to Knoxville this fall. So in addition to providing artists uh, for several of their featured events and, and programs, Knoxville Opera is mounting a fully staged production that highlights the sacrifices that these heroes and their families have made for our freedom. So 
also with the Medal of Honor recipients. You know, unlike their older counterparts, m the more recent recipients of the Medal of Honor, they want to talk about serious issues confronting soldiers today, PTSD, suicide, uh, domestic issues, um, you know, substance abuse, all these things. They want to talk about this, engage in these forums and utilizing the Medal of Honor Convention to engage in these conversations. Well, opera as a medium is a very powerful storyteller and, and thus can be a great launch point for conversations around these issues. Our first opera fits the bill for just that. So on September 9th and September 11, we'll present a new production of Glory Denied. So based on a book by Tom Philpott, this 80 minute chamber opera tells the true story of Colonel Jim Thompson, America's longest held prisoner of war. Colonel Thompson spent nine years in captivity. That's 3,278 days. So this story not only deals though with his suffering in the jungle of Southeast Asia, but also the tragic aftermath following his liberation. This whole opera, above all, is actually a story of family, particularly a husband and wife struggling to adapt to one of our, most, our nation's most turbulent eras. I mean, you think about it, just the role of women and the way it changed through, the, through, through Vietnam. He came back to a very different world than he left. So, um, you know, I'm excited to say that the author of the book and the composer of the opera, they're going to come to Knoxville and be part of uh, the activities surrounding this production. I also wanted to mention that our venues for next season were extremely limited, um, making the scheduling very difficult. Um, many of you know Hamilton's coming to town. That didn't help because uh, that pushed a lot of people out. And, you know, people are e organizations are eager to get back on stage. So finding a sta space for any of these productions was just a Herculean feat. And fortunately, given the high profile of the Medal of Honor Convention, I made some phone calls and said, please help. Um, We've been given the opportunity to present this production in Cox Auditorium uh, at Alumni Hall on the UT campus. Now, don't worry, it's on the weekend, it's not on a game day, and we'll be very clear communicating on all the convenient places you can park to do that. But we are so incredibly blessed to have this space because we literally did not have another option. And when this popped up, they made a few phone calls and made it happen, and I'm so grateful for that. The other thing I wanted to mention is that to honor our commitment to telling their stories um, and to thank them for their service. Knoxville Opera will provide free tickets to any and all veterans, members, enlisted members of the military and their families for this production. So when the time comes, yeah. Because we're telling their story. So we, we are not extractive. This is their story that we're telling. So it's, it's our duty and obligation, I think, to share this with them and for us to help gain understanding in the sacrifices they make. But when the time comes, I hope you'll spread the word about that because we will have seats to fill and we want them to be full. And, and we'll have Medal of Honor recipients in the audience and perhaps in the talk bags afterwards. It's gonna be a really extraordinary experience. On November 4th and 6th, we return to the Tennessee Theater for Franz Lehar's charming, charming and uplifting comedy, The Merry Widow. One of the best known works in the operetta repertoire, this show is a constant stream of memorable melodies. Dean Anthony's original English version tells the story of romance, intrigue, and comedic misadventure. You're welcome for that. Um, what, one very exciting element of this production will be the collaboration with the University of Tennessee Opera Theater Program. So highlighting our investment in this partnership, Mary Widow is actually going to be, it will serve as UT's fall opera production. So this is a legitimate co-production we're doing here. And Kevin Class, the music director, of, of uh, UT Opera Theater Program will conduct the show. And as part of their coursework, UT students will have an opportunity to participate in the ensemble, uh, several secondary roles, and some of them will even be cast as covers for the principal artists. So Dean Anthony will be on campus to offer cast classes in dialogue and movement and staging, while Elizabeth Moore will offer coachings as, as these students prepare uh, their assignments. So at the onset of the, uh, of the company staging rehearsals, in October, the UT students will actually have a presentation of their own uh, on the a preview performance, if you will, on the, on the UT campus. And then we'll all gather together for the KO production, working side by side with a cast of world-class artists that are coming to town to sing in the principal roles. Our third and final season 
will be Mozart's Marriage of Figaro. On a personal note, this opera means a lot to me because this was me singing my very first uh, Figaro 14 years ago at Cleveland Opera. And it, yay. Well, it just so happens that in that first production, I ended up meeting my wife, Carrie. And yeah, it's two singers who vowed never to date another singer. We saw how that worked out. Well, anyway, it's been 20 years since Kale has produced this masterpiece. And we are looking forward to bringing this jewel box production to the Bijou Theater on April 28th and 30th. That's our set. It's in our warehouse right now. So beyond those three fully staged productions, KO will continue to present a myriad of programs and performances throughout the season. So you've already heard a bit about the Guild activities uh, for next year. Uh, Knox Opera for All will continue to deliver free programs and performances. The Neighborhood Choir After School program will hopefully have a full uninterrupted year at Sarah Moore Green Elementary School. We look forward to an expanded season of the Knoxville Opera Gospel Choir. There are also a couple of very interesting projects in development uh, as we speak. The first is a new opera uh, designed and uh, specifically written for young audiences. It's called Stop Bully. And conceived by Dean Anthony, uh, this will be a fully digital production that we will distribute to schools throughout the region. Um, Plans for an in-school production, perhaps in the following year, uh, would be in the works and potentially with, with UT uh, involved with that. But we're excited about you know, delivering digital content to schools, a uh, way that we can have more uh, wider reach and greater impact. And of course, we have the Rossini Festival, KO's annual gift to the city that highlights, uh, features performers from all around, all of our local artists that we celebrate that day. Um, Stay tuned in the months ahead for some interesting developments for next year's festival. Some things are underway and you know, we're scheming a little bit to maybe perhaps make a few updates to that. So stay tuned. Did I lose any of you? So I know that's a lot of information to share. So, but I hope you enjoyed hearing you know, about these exciting developments for Knoxville Opera. I'll conclude by saying, you know, I continue to be humbled by the generosity of the people uh, of this town. Um, Knoxville Opera, you know, we'll need all of you in the, in the weeks and months ahead with the storms and the unanticipated consequences of COVID and beyond. And I'm so grateful that each of you understands the connective power of the arts. And I sincerely hope that you'll continue to advocate and support all of the arts in Knoxville because they are the lifeblood of our civic life. So be good, be well, be kind, and thank you. So I don't have a whole lot to say after that. Um, I mean, you, you can see there's so many exciting things on the horizon. So many great things are going to happen next year. So with that, I will say they have brought out a bunch more fried shrimp. There's still a lot of dessert left. So with that, uh, please make sure you do not leave here hungry. We will go ahead and call this meeting adjourned. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful night and be safe.